everybody. Welcome to Odd and Untold, the podcast where we talk about all things strange and spooky. And this week, we're going to be talking about some Irish paranormal creatures, supernatural creatures, creatures from legend. Uh, St. Paddy's Day just passed, and I thought it'd be a good time to look at some paranormal creatures from Ireland, the mythology, the folklore. And it's a good tie in to an episode we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, Bigfoot in the British Isles, uh, which people seem to like. And uh, that was really focused on Bigfoot and Bigfoot like legends in Scotland, like the gray, the big gray man of Ben Makdu and uh, other creatures like that. But I wanted to focus this week on Ireland and uh, we can talk about some of those creatures uh, because it is St. Patrick's Day. I am Irish, uh, part Irish, half Irish, half Polish, half Italian, and the other half is other stuff. And my math might be a little off on that. But uh, I love Ireland. My favorite band comes from Ireland, possibly the greatest band in the world right now, depending on who you are and what you believe. And if you don't believe that, you're wrong. But uh, they're my favorite band, Irish. Like I said, I'm, I'm Irish, so I love a good love a good pint on St. Patty's Day. So today we're going to dive into some paranormal mythical creatures from the Emerald Isle. Okay, so I wanted to mention too, this episode is going to be a little bit shorter today. I'm dealing with leprechauns, so good time to talk about the shortness of this episode. Um, so let's just go a little bit over the, the legend of the leprechaun. Uh, and this is from Wikipedia, and I will put links to everything I talk about here today in the description below. A, a leprechaun is a diminutive supernatural being in Irish folklore, classed by some as a type of solitary fairy. They are usually depicted as little bearded men wearing a coat and hat who partake in mischief. In later times, they have been depicted as shoemakers who have a hidden pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Leprechaun-like creatures rarely appear in Irish mythology and only became prominent in later folklore. So these are things I didn't really know. Um, you think leprechauns go way, way back, and they, they really don't. Um, not that far back. Uh, but, you know, you think of St. Paddy's Day, everybody thinks of leprechauns. Uh, the green outfits, the hat, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, uh, you know, Lucky Charms, the cereal, the leprechaun horror movies. So um, everybody knows leprechauns. People think of leprechauns. Uh, so the entomology of this, of this the Anglo-Irish word leprechaun is descended from the old Irish lucurpan or luprechaun in various uh, Middle Irish forms. Uh, the current spelling, Leprechaun, is used throughout Ireland, but there are numerous regional variants. Uh, John O'Donovan's supplement to O'Reilly's Irish-English Dictionary defines Lurcon, Lugracon, Luprechaun as a sprite, a pygmy, a fairy of a diminutive size who always carries a purse containing a shilling. The Irish term Lethbragan in O'Reilly's Dictionary has also been recognized as an alternative spelling. Other variant spellings in English have included, and I'm not even going to read these, there's a bunch of them here, Lubricon, Leprechaun, Leprechaun. Um, the first recorded instance of the word in the English language was in Decker's comedy, The Honest Whore, Part 2, from 1604. As for your Irish Lubricon, that spirit, whom by preposterous charms thy lust hath raised in a wrong circle. Uh, so the meaning of the word, the word may have been coined as a compound of the roots lu or lagu, from the Greek meaning small, and corp from Latin, corpus or body, uh, or so it has been suggested by Whitley Stokes, so small body. Uh, research published in 2019 suggests the word derives from the Luperci, an associated Roman festival of Lupercalia. Folk entomology derives the word from leith, half, and brog, brogue, because of the frequent portrayal of the leprechaun as working on a single shoe, as evident in the alternative spelling lethbragan. The earliest known reference to the leprechaun appears in the medieval tale known as Ectra Fergus Mac Leti, The Adventures of Fergus, Son of Leti. The saga exists in two widely divergent versions. Uh, the first of these is written in Dublin, uh, and this is dated to the 8th century. The uh, second version is a copy of the 8th century text written on a single leaf inserted into London British Library. The saga was rewritten in the 13th century as a burlesque version. So it goes back to like the 8th century. 
Uh, the leprechaun is said to be a solitary creature whose principal occupation is making and cobbling shoes and who enjoys practical jokes. In McAnally's 1888 account, the leprechaun was not a professional cobbler, but was frequently seen mending his own shoes as he runs about so much he wears them out with great frequency. This is, he claims, the perfect opportunity for a human being to capture the leprechaun, refusing to release him until the leprechaun gives his captor supernatural wealth. So the the gold at the end of the rainbow, if you will. Uh, and leprechauns remind me a lot of uh, what we have here, allegedly, in uh, North America, the Pukwudgie, which is a Native American legend of small, sort of hairy people who are mischievous. And I, I've touched on the puck wedgies in, in previous episodes. Haven't really done a full episode on the puck wedgie yet, but that that's um, a, a sort of corollary there to the leprechaun. Um, and again, in popular culture, you have Lucky, the mascot of Lucky Charm Cereal. You have Hornswoggle. He was a professional wrestler uh, in WWE. Uh, the horror slasher films Leprechaun and its sequel starring Warwick Davis from Star Wars fame, uh, the Disney film Darby O'Gill and the Little People. So you have a, a lot of Leprechaun lore in the world. And like I said, on St. Patrick's Day, you just see it everywhere. Lucky Charm cereal is just a very recognizable folkloric creature from Ireland and had to touch on it. How can you talk about St. Patrick's Day and not talk about Leprechauns? So... There's a little bit of a leprechaun history for you. Okay, so another very popular Irish folkloric supernatural creature I want to talk about is the banshee. And I think most people have heard of the banshee. It's, you know, I remember growing up, my mother would always say, you know, stop screaming like banshees to me and my, my brothers. Um, so I'll read a little bit of this. A banshee, a uh, woman of the fairy mound or fairy woman, is a female spirit in Irish folklore who heralds the death of a family member, usually by screaming, wailing, shrieking, or keening. Her name is connected to the mythologically important tumuli or mounds that dot the Irish countryside, which are known as stede in Old Irish. So a description of the banshee, sometimes she has long streaming hair, which she may be seen combing, with some legends specifying she can only keen while combing her hair. She wears a gray cloak over a green dress, and her eyes are red from continual weeping. She may be dressed in white with red hair and a ghastly complexion, according to a firsthand account by Anne Lady Fanshawe in her memoirs. Lady Wilde in her books provides others. The size of the banshee is another physical feature that differs between regional accounts. Though some accounts of her standing unnaturally tall are recorded, the majority of tales that describe her height state the banshee's stature as short, anywhere between one foot and four feet. Her exceptional shortness often goes alongside the description of her as an old woman, though it may also be intended to emphasize her state as a fairy creature. Sometimes the banshee assumes the form of some sweet singing virgin of the family who died young and has been given the mission by the invisible powers to become the harbinger of coming doom to her mortal kindred. Or she may be seen at night as a shrouded woman crouched beneath the trees, lamenting with a veiled face or flying past in the moonlight, crying bitterly. And the cry of this spirit is mournful beyond all other sounds on earth and betokens certain death to some family member of the family whenever it is heard in the silence of the night. So to pause here for a second, we have a few overlapping things. Um, many ghosts. I mean, there's so many just ghostly legends of the, the woman in white, the lady in white, wearing a, a, a white dress, weeping for her lost lover. And you hear about this, you know, on coastal areas where, you know, her husband went out to sea and never came back. Um, so I, I found that interesting. Um, two, now there's this also re reports that the Banshee is small. So it harkens back to fairy creatures, leprechauns, puck wedgies, these smaller entities, if you will, that are uh, humanoid. They're people, you know, this is a woman, but one to four feet tall. So that's very short, um, similar to leprechauns. So I, I just wanted to point that out. I thought that was really interesting. So I just wanted to touch on this, uh, the keening, because um, I mentioned that earlier. So in Ireland and parts of Scotland, a traditional part of mourning is the keening woman who wails a lament. Uh, so that is what keening is. It's, it's crying um, as part of mourning. So Irish legend speaks of a lament being sung by a fairy woman or banshee. 
She would sing it when a family member died or was about to die, even if the person had died far away and news of their death had not yet come. In those cases, her wailing would be the first warning the household had of the death. The banshee is also a predictor of death. If someone is about to enter a situation where it is unlikely they will come out alive, she will warn people by screaming or wailing, giving rise to a banshee, also being known as a wailing woman. The banshee was also associated with the death, death coach being said to either summon it with her keening or to travel in tandem with it. So you have this sort of harbinger of death, uh, the banshee or the siren song. I was thinking that too. You sort of have the siren song of the mermaids. Um, but with the banshee, it seems to be less malicious and more of a warning, uh, a predictor of death or someone, you know, has died and the banshee is, is letting people know about that. When several banshees appear at once, it indicates the death of someone great or holy. The tales sometime recounted that the woman, though called a fairy, was a ghost, often of a specific murdered woman or a mother who died in childbirth. So this doesn't really pair with um, men who die. Um, it would only be women then because the banshee is described as a female woman, feminine spirit or entity. So um, that's interesting to me as well. So yeah, there, there's a lot of banshees in popular culture, uh, Scooby-Doo and the real Ghostbusters cartoon and other media. There's, you know, you'll see the screaming ghost, the wailing ghost, and they'll call it a banshee. I, I think there was even a, like an X-Men character called Banshee from Marvel Comics. Uh, and here you can also see like under the sea also, there's the siren, there's the white lady ghost. So there's overlap in these sorts of legends and mythology and folklore. Um, that it just seems like a lot of these cultures have similar entities that they refer to and speak about. So I thought that was pretty cool. So here's one that I've, I've heard of, but it's not very well known. And there's a reason for that. Um, but it is a lake monster and it is called the Mucky. Uh, so I will read this. In Irish folklore, Mucky is the name given to the reported mysterious creature said to inhabit the, inhabit the lakes of Killarney in Ireland. In 2003, scientists conducted a series of sonar scans to determine local fish populations. However, a large solid object in the water was recorded, which has led to the theory that the lake is inhabited by some form of lake monster similar to the famed Nessie of Loch Ness. So, yeah, you have Nessie right next door in Scotland, which is the most famous lake monster, if not one of the most famous cryptids out there. I mean, even people who have no interest in cryptozoology, you say Loch Ness monster, people know what you're talking about. But Mucky doesn't really get as much uh, press. Uh, the name Mucky comes from a portmanteau of Muckross, one of the three Killarney lakes, and the IE suffix to mimic the Loch Ness's Nessie. Uh, lake Champlain has Champ and uh, Lake Ogopogo, and uh, they, they will shorten the name sometimes to just give it like a, a nickname to the monster. Instead of saying Loch Ness monster, they say Nessie. Uh, instead of Lake Champlain monster, they say Champ. Uh, tourism interests have tried to encourage the legend without any success. Again, this really hasn't taken off the way the Loch Ness Monster has as far as popular culture. So, uh, And then lastly, in October 2004, a Japanese TV crew spent a week in the region looking for Mucky. I'm guessing they never found it or we probably would have heard about it. Um, I've made my thoughts very clear on lake monsters. I, I tend to not really put much credence in them certain ones more than others but overall i think there's a lot of lake monsters out there and i think a lot of them can be debunked or a lot of the sightings can be debunked i think just spotting something on the water is much tougher than say spotting bigfoot in the woods uh, i know i'm kind of splitting hairs here but that's just my personal opinion but if you guys love lake monsters check out mucky uh sort of nessie's cousin here so the next creature I want to talk about, this is another one that I, I've heard about, I've been reading about since I was a kid, uh, but doesn't get a lot of traction. A lot of people don't really talk about this, is the, the Dobar Chu. And the Dobar Chu, uh, water dog, water hound, or king otter, uh, is a creature of Irish folklore. It resembles both a dog and an otter, though it is sometimes described as half dog, half fish. It lives in water and has fur with protective properties. There are little to no written records of the Dobar Chu since its legends 
has relied heavily on oral storytelling and tradition. So again, probably something more from folklore and mythology rather than actual sightings. Um, the description, uh, the physical description resembles an otter, but said to be about five times as large. So about 10 to 15 feet in length with a white pelt, black ear tips, and a black cross shape on its back. Though due to the murky waters it is said to reside in, its pelt may be portrayed as darker. So that's, an, you know, a very large otter. And again, it, it sounds like, almost like a hairy lake monster, this long, I mean, otters are very sort of sinewy. They're, they're thin. Um, they pop their heads up. Uh, there's a picture of it right here, an artist impression of the Dobar Chu. And, you know, if you're looking at this out of the corner of her eye, this could look like a lake monster. So it is, is a combination. Uh, Dobar Chu is one of the two most common Irish words for otter. So that's where that comes from. And I just wanted to talk about this. There's this uh, a headstone found in Cornwall Cemetery in Glendale, County Leitrim, depicts the Dobar Chu and is related to the tale of an attack on a local woman by the creature. The stone is claimed to be the headstone of a grave of a woman killed by the Dobar Chu in the 18th century. The monument is a recumbent flag of sandstone. Uh, it depicts a recumbent animal having body and legs like those of a dog with the characteristic depth of rib and strength of thigh. The tail, long and curved, shows a definite tuft. The rear of the haunch, and still more to the tail, are an exceptionally low relief, apparently due to the loss of a thin flake from the face of the slab. So far, the description is canine. The lettering and carving are in relief. So there's this headstone about this woman, dedicated to this woman who was allegedly killed by Dobar Chu. And I'll get into this legend here. So in 1722, Grace McLaughlin, locally known as Grace Connolly, her maiden name, lived in the townland of Crivelli in the northwest corner of Glenade Loch. One morning, she went down to the Loch Lake to wash some clothes. Some accounts say that her husband, Terence, rushed to the shore after hearing her scream, whilst others say that she went down after she failed to return that evening, that he went down. Both accounts say Mr. McLaughlin rushed down only to find her mutilated body with the Dobar Chu sleeping on top of her. Terence runs home and grabs a dagger before returning to kill the Dobar Chu. As the beast died, it let out a whistling yell to its mate, who soon rose from the loch. The second beast chased him from the loch, and after a long and bloody battle, which some accounts say he did not face alone, he killed the second Dobar Chu. So, again, another sort of legend from the early 1700s. Uh, this was probably some other creature that got... Um, exaggerated uh it's also very possible that her husband killed her and made up this tale and now you have this legend of this giant otter creature that killed his wife uh, again forensics back then weren't the same women's rights weren't the same so a man said something you know my wife died and he actually killed her but he said someone else did it or some creature did it local authorities would you know not necessarily dig too deep into that so sad state of affairs um but again, if you look down here under the sea also, uh, you'll see lake monsters, selkie, kelpie, the water horse. So all these other sort of lake monster uh, cross-references to uh, the Dobar Chu, that it lives in water, rarely seen. I mean, this seems like a legend born out of perhaps some foul play, if you're <laughs> asking my opinion. That's kind of what it sounds like. I don't necessarily believe that a giant otter ate this man's wife. So, so this next creature is more um, broad. It's found in, in a lot of European folklore. Uh, it's called the changeling. And most people, when I say changeling, are going to understand what I mean, you know, shapeshifter. Um, but I will read a little bit about the changeling. Uh, a changeling, also historically referred to as an off or oaf, is a human-like creature found throughout much of European folklore. A changeling was a substitute left by a supernatural being on kidnapping a human being. Sometimes the changeling was a stock, a piece of wood made magically to resemble the kidnapped human. More often, the changeling was a supernatural being made magically to look like the kidnapped human. Supernatural beings blamed for stealing children included fairies, demons, trolls, nereids, and many others. Usually, the kidnapped human was a child, but there were cases, particularly in Scandinavia and Ireland, where adults were taken. So changelings... Uh, 
in sci-fi, I mean, most notably like Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, uh, the changelings were a species of aliens that would sort of come in, kill uh, or abduct um, someone from like Starfleet or the Federation and then take their place and they were the changeling. So, um, but they would move. They weren't just like a wooden dummy, basically. Um, they were like actually people who would act out the part of the person they were replacing. Uh, so in Irish legend, since we're talking about Ireland, a fairy child may appear sickly. It will not grow in size like a normal child. It may have notable physical characteristics such as a beard or long teeth. They may also display intelligence far beyond their apparent years and possess uncanny insight. A common way that a changeling could identify itself is through displaying unusual behavior when, it's th when it thinks it's alone, such as jumping about, dancing, or playing an instrument. Though this last example is found only within Irish and Scottish legend. So, again, uh, almost like a mischievous sort of creature uh, that takes over uh, as it's replacing a child who has been taken, kidnapped. Uh, but then when it's alone, it's kind of dancing and jumping about. And it just kind of sounds very similar to leprechauns and puck wedgies and, and, and all of that. And, you know, to me, this almost reads, you know, with, with a modern eye and as someone with a psychology degree, as mental illness um, a child who's going through something not acting themselves uh, and they attribute this to that the child was taken and replaced by a changeling and that's why the behavior is different that's why this child is acting not normal quote unquote so i just wanted to point that out so to focus on the irish part of the legend there, there's many different legends in here and again i will link to this article that you guys can check it out but i'm going to focus on ireland so in ireland looking at a baby with envy overlooking the baby was dangerous as it endangered the baby who was then in the fairy's power so too was admiring or envying a woman or man dangerous unless the person added a blessing the non-disabled and beautiful were in particular danger women were especially in danger in liminal states being a new bride or mother putting a changeling in a fire would cause it to jump up the chimney and return the human child still at least one tale recounts a mother with a changeling finding that a fairy woman came to her home with the human child saying the other fairies had done the exchange and she wanted her own baby. The tale of surprising a changeling into speech by brewing eggshells is also, turned in, is also told in Ireland as in Wales. Various legends describe other ways to foil a would-be fairy kidnapper. One was to shout, Garen Agus Corscum Thu, I bless you, or God bless you, like sneezing, <laughs> which would cause the fairy to abandon the child and it was trying to steal. Another possible tactic was to insert oneself into an argument over who would keep the child, shouting, give it to me, would trick the fairy into releasing the child back to a human. In some instances, changelings were regarded not as substituted fairy children, but as old fairies brought to the human world to die. Irish legends regarding changelings typically follow the same formula. A tailor is the one who first notices a changing. The inclusion of a fairy playing bagpipes or some other instrument and the kidnapping of a human child through a window. So again, this mischievous sort of thing. The modern Irish girl's name, Siofra, means an elvish or changeling child, deriving from Siobra, meaning fairies. So, pretty cool. So I wanted to touch on this, and I didn't even read this when I mentioned this earlier, but um, some medical explanations in the modern world. Modern scholars hypothesize some changeling tales developed in an attempt to explain deformed, developmentally disabled, or neurodivergent children. So children with diseases, mental illnesses, mental health issues, uh, any of these things that were not really understood until modern times could have been attributed to uh, changelings. And again, I think exorcisms and demonic possession, I think there's a lot of that as well, that there was mental health issues uh, that were not being addressed and not being understood. And so, you know, we tend to frame things, uh, we human beings tend to frame things on terms that we understand at the time. So depending on where you are in history, it's a changeling, it's a demonic possession, it's, you know, alien abductions or, you know, whatever, whatever we, we kind of want to frame things as we have to look at that because that informs a lot of what's going on here. You know, are there really fairies taking children or is this just people trying to explain why their child is suddenly acting differently? And then here in popular culture, Again, I mentioned Star Trek Deep Space Nine, um, My Little Pony, um, Supernatural, 
the TV show Supernatural. So there, there's changelings all over the place in pop culture. Okay, so the last creature I'm going to talk about this week for this episode is the Bodach. Um, the Bodach is a trickster or a boogeyman figure in Gaelic folklore and mythology. The Bodach, old man, is paired with the Keliach, hag, old woman, in Irish legend. So you have these kind of two, you know, the old man, boogeyman, the old woman, boogeyman, old hag. Um, these two kind of running parallel in the, the, the culture. But this is this is more of a boogeyman uh, trickster still, you know, this mischievous. We, we see this a lot with a lot of these creatures, the, the mischief, the, you know, they're, they're, they're jerks, basically. <laughs> um, they trick people. Um, so the name Bodak, Old Irish, also Botak, is the Irish word for a tenant, a serf, or a peasant. It is derived from Bode, Old Irish Bod, meaning tail or penis. So even the you know, people just don't like them, you know, basically calling them a dick. Uh, the word has alternatively been derived from both cottage and hut. Uh, the term tenant farmer is thus equivalent to a cotter. A dare botak was a half free peasant of a lower class. In either case, the name is formed by the addition of nominal suffix ach, uh, meaning connected or involved with, belonging to. So in folklore, uh, the bodak or old man becomes a type of burglar to the point of being identified with the devil. In the early modern 16th or 17th century tale, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce this, um, the bodak is identified with the Manon Machler. This identification inspired Lady Gregory's tale, Menonen at Play, where Menonen makes an appearance in disguise as, quote, a clown. Old striped clothes he had, and puddle water splashing in his shoes, and his sword sticking out naked behind him, and his ears through the old cloak that was over his head, and in his hand he had three spears of Hollywood scorched and blackened. Uh, in Scottish folklore, the Bodak comes down the chimney to kidnap naughty children, used as a cautionary tale or boogeyman figure to frighten children into good behavior. A related being known as the Bodak Gloss, Old Grey Man, is considered an omen of death. In Walter Scott's novel, Waverly, Fergus McAvore sees a Bodak Gloss, which foretells his death. In Yeats's 1903 prose version of The Hourglass, the character of the fool remarks at one point during the play that a Bodak he met upon the roadside attempted to trick him with a riddle into letting the creature near his coin. So again, we have this sort of mischievous, uh, child-stealing entity, uh, it, you know, a boogeyman figure to frighten children into good behavior. So almost like the, the Krampus or the Belchnickel, uh, where it's going to come and punish the children. And it, it's more of a cautionary figure. Um, so interesting that, because uh, again, I think many cultures just have a boogeyman uh don't go into the woods or the boogers will get you the boogeyman lives in your closet and if you don't go to sleep he's going to come out and get you and even santa claus you know like santa's not going to come until you go to sleep so a lot of these sort of mythological figures used to control or frighten children or get them to behave uh very interesting um uh, but this one sort of has this uh duality of uh, being in ireland and scotland and um i thought it was interesting that it, it talks about um the old gray man like that reminds me of the the gray gray man of ben mock that we talked about a few weeks ago which is more of a, a a bigfoot sort of creature um so all of these things you know and, and this is the great thing about folklore all of this stuff sort of gets intertwined interconnected and it's hard to really pull apart what's real and what's made up and what's just oral tradition that's been passed down and then spread to other regions and it it adapts it it changes it evolves into something else uh so yeah really interesting and very hard to pull apart where these things you know where the truth begins or ends and the legend begins or vice versa all right everyone so i'm going to uh, cut the show short there this week um just wanted to do a quick overview of some some cool irish legends uh, to piggyback off of St. Patrick's Day and our episode on Bigfoot in the British Isles. And uh, just uh, wanted to say that moving forward, I'm going to change the scheduling of this show. Uh, right now, we publish Tuesday mornings, very early Tuesday mornings. And just because of certain things going on in my life uh, with work and personal things and appointments, 
I'm going to change the publishing date to Friday evenings. So probably around 7 p.m. on Fridays. So uh, I don't know when that change is going to take place, but probably within the next week or so. It's just been very difficult for me to record, uh, to book guests because my schedule as it is now, it changes so frequently and unexpectedly sometimes that it's been very difficult for me to to get guests on. So that's why I kind of stick to John and Scott lately because those guys don't care if I cancel last minute. They're good guys and they understand. <laughs> that's what friends are for, us uh, to understand when your podcaster friend has to cancel at the last minute. So um, yeah, I think just moving the schedule a little bit publishing on Fridays will just help me put out better content, longer content. It'll give me more time to edit and will cause me less stress in the in the long run. Because right now it's just by the time I get the episode recorded and try to do my editing, I'm doing little bits of editing here and there. And then I find myself sometimes like up late on Monday nights, just crunching, trying to get the episodes done and, and set to publish. So I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to publish on Friday evenings. I think that'll just work better for my schedule overall. So be on the lookout for that. It may not take place immediately. It might take a week or so before that changes, but just wanted to give you guys a heads up on that. And um, if you guys have any stories you want to talk to me about, share on the show or just via email, and I can read them on the air, jason at oddanduntold.com. Email is up here. And um, until next week, everybody, I hope you enjoyed your St. Patty's Day. Hope you're not too hungover. I stayed off away from the beer this year, so good on me, I guess. Um, but until next time, everybody, rock and roll.